Good. So nice to meet you. Big fan of your channel. You do awesome stuff. Oh, well, thank you very much. Big fan of you and you guys over at yeah. Hot 8. Incredible. You guys are doing incredible things. I have a million questions. So, um, all right. Well, you want me to get to my get to my stuff? Yes. Yeah, let's boogie. <laughs> All right, perfect. I, can I just uh, let you introduce yourself and, and say who you are and, and what you do? Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Sue Ennis. I am Vice President of Corporate Development and Head of Investor Relations at Hut 8 Mining. We are one of the largest digital asset miners in the world with the highest amount of self-mined Bitcoin. And we recently bridged into the data center space. So we're really excited to chat with you today. Awesome. And that is definitely something I want to talk about with you you guys got some stuff going on that maybe some other miners don't have going on. So I want to mm -hmm. welcome you to the channel. Uh, thank you so much for taking some time out of your schedule. So we're so glad to have you here. Um, we've done a bunch of videos on hut eight. So I think my audience is very familiar with what you guys do, but I know you're doing some new stuff now. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. yeah so let's get into it. So I was hoping to, yeah, well, the, fir I'm, the first thing I want to ask you is I was surprised. It was actually a, there was a press release today regarding uh, what? What I guess a public relations, a, a new employee. Yes, new head of marketing. Head of marketing. All right. Yeah. So, is that somebody that's going to take some burden off of you, or? No. So, so the role of Aaron, our new head of marketing, is with this latest data center acquisition. We have four hundred commercial customers in the traditional cloud and co-location space. Um, and so Aaron's gonna be tasked with effectively not only driving more of the customer base to that particular part of our services offering, but also increasing um, some of our digital marketing initiatives, especially when it comes to engaging regulatory and government um, and just driving more awareness on that front as well. Also with the traditional tech media as well. Um, she's got really strong media relations with, again, sort of like the CNBCs. Um, we're, we're just looking to sort of beef up our, our our traditional tech and media relations efforts. Okay, so I know, I mean, I see you and Jamie out a lot in front of the yeah. camera, kind of spreading the word. So it seems like this is, and it's, so you got so, 400 so she, new customers. Yeah, and so so Aaron's role isn't to be camera facing. She's more on the back end, just making sure that we have the right marketing and digital processes in place to continue to build out that customer base, but also engage an entire new set of eyes on us in the traditional media. And this is a new position, am I right? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, we've never had this position before. All right. Well, you guys are growing. So that leads me to the thing that I really wanted to ask you about until I saw that press release this morning. So you guys had a big acquisition. Yes. Can you tell me a little bit? So you bought TerraGo, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. So, so we bought the data center business off of Terrago. Um, and it's, so we bought effectively five data centers across Canada. They're all powered by renewable resources, by the way, um, and 400 commercial uh, enterprise customers in the traditional cloud um, services space that Ter Terrago had. Uh, we bought it for about $30 million cash. It is accretive. Um, and we're really excited because, um, you know, one of the things we really see and what we truly believe in is if you actually believe in Bitcoin and distributed open source infrastructure, it doesn't just stop at holding Bitcoin. You know, everyone's chasing and hodling and whatnot for, for sort of this output, but, but then what, right? So, so we truly believe that if you actually believe in this new paradigm, be it, you know, in terms of peer-to-peer -peer lending, in terms of data transfer, gaming, play-to-earn gaming, then we want to start investing in that space as well. And we're always going to be core Bitcoin miners, but investing in the infrastructure of the future of Web3, of the nascent applications that are being built on these open infrastructures, we think is a long-term game that that is going to enable us to capture a tremendous amount of market share. So that's why we did this. Plus, it's it's diversifying our business, right? We, have, we now have a side of our business that is still focused on the digital economy, but is also uncorrelated directly with digital asset mining itself. So, so diversification was another priority for us as well with this move. Yeah, that's key. And I've heard you talk about that. And I know you guys are kind of out ahead of everybody, I think, on, on this. So, yeah. Um, what I was going to ask you is, uh, you guys have 10,000 
uh, I think, what are they, the NVIDIA GPUs? Yeah, so last spring we bought 10,000 of a limited fleet of NVIDIA GPU miners. They're effectively the Ferrari of GPU miners. Um, we were one of three customers globally who were able to get those miners. So I know you were kind of, I was looking at the economics of it and I've heard you guys talk about it and it seems like you're actually able to mine Bitcoin through those, mine Ethereum yeah. and convert it to Bitcoin at less than your actual uh, ASIC machines, I, I think. Yeah. Is that uh, true? Uh, yeah, margins, about 95% uh, margins. So that's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, so our, our January production numbers will be out shortly. Um, so we'll have, we'll have some more color for you guys around that, but, um, but I look, was hoping so that would be today. And I could, I know, I know <laughs> to be honest, so was I, um, but we're going to need to wait one more day All or a right. couple more days. Um, the, so, so that GPU acquisition was, was multi-purpose. Number one, obviously it was, you know, we don't think being single threaded and at the behest of ASIC, equipment um, dynamics is is um, a good strategy. We don't want to be single threaded. Um, also, the um, we've now been training our team since last spring on GPU miners and how to manage that iteration of high performance compute, which ties into this data center move. Because with Terago, so traditionally in a traditional data center, there's about 40% of white space of underutilized cap capacity. And oftentimes that's, you know, where data centers, a customer is exited or they're waiting for one to come in. So what we're going to do is that 40% of white space, we're going to be filling with GPU miners and continue our mine Ethereum, get paid out in Bitcoin, but also build out services and sort of like the Amazon web infrastructure service for web three applications. So blockchain as a service, blockchain storage, um, because that's what gaming and NFTs and all of these exciting applications and metaverse that we're all talking about, all of that needs infrastructure. So that's where we see our role in, in, the, in, this, in this industry. Yeah, that's what I had in my head. It just seemed like based on a lot of conversations I've heard you guys have, it, you know, at the moment you're mining, you're able to mine Ethereum, but at some point, theoretically here, although I'll believe it when I see it, uh, yeah. you know, it's going to switch to uh, proof of stake, I guess. Um, so do those 10,000 basically shift into your, your high performance, the, the Terago world, I guess. So, so they could, because the servers that they sit in are designed for, for tier ones, so traditional high performance compute. Um, but but look, we're, we're also in the similar camp that the, the, the issue with proof of stake um, is that it's not a technology issue that could go to proof of stake tomorrow morning. It's a governance issue, right? So, um, but even if let's say Ethereum went to proof of stake tomorrow morning, we could just mine uh, the next most profitable GPU based coins so like an Ethereum classic. But, but again, we're, we're, we're really seeing the appetite and the and the opportunity in, for example, the play to earn gaming world, the Axie Infinity, some of these major NFT projects, all of them need storage, all of them need infrastructure, uh, node management, pool node management, all of that is a growing services industry that is wildly underserved right now. And again, we see ourselves as masons of infrastructure of the future. If that, if that makes any sense. And maybe that's, maybe that's the first time I've said masons of infrastructure, but, but that's where we're thinking on this, that it doesn't just stop at holding Bitcoin. Right. So are you guys actually thinking, I know with your, with the data center, like you mentioned, there's a lot of what you're calling customers right now, are those potential partners in the future to get involved in that? Or are you more just going to service that industry? I mean, look, there's, I, I can't get into anything we haven't <laughs> press released yet. Um, but, uh, Look, 10% are in the gaming and media and entertainment space. Um, and if you look at, you know, what companies like Microsoft and Activision have done, um, pretty much every single major gaming company has a blockchain metaverse strategy. Um, and we feel very confident that we're positioned to service in that in that space. So, Okay, nice. You guys are yeah. doing, you're setting up um, a third mining site. Yeah. Yes. So... I was hoping to talk about that. Uh, it seemed like it was going to be in one spot and now it's going to be in another spot, but you have a partner in there 
that I think is an important partnership for you guys with power. So can you tell us? A yeah, little about it that? is. It is. So, um, Jamie, our CEO, one thing that is a real competitive differentiator for us is her background. So she's been in the traditional high performance compute space, data infrastructure space for over 20 years. So that's number one, how she was, she's actually known about these Terrago assets uh, for, for quite a while. She's had her eye on them even before at HUD8. Um, and also oh, wow. she has tremendous relationships um, in the power space. So Validus, our power with this, our power partner for this third uh, site build out, she's known for years. Um, and what was really great about Validus is that they have multiple locations throughout Canada. And so, yes, initially our third site was supposed to be in Alberta. But what happened is Alberta went back into lockdown uh, in August and September. And so our engineers on the ground said, you know, listen, guys, we effectively, we can't get anything done right now. Like this is, this is just not going to go on schedule as planned. So we, so within a matter of days, we actually were able to pivot to another opportunity in North Bay with an absolutely similar climate. I mean, it's not desert, but it's freezing cold. It's windy, which again is optimal mining temperatures. Right. Um, and it's behind the fence. Um, and we did have a minor delay. That initial 35 megawatts was supposed to be stood up at the end of Q4, but there was a minor delay with some equipment. Um, but we feel pretty confident that we're going to be able to stand it up by the end of Q1. Um, and yeah, we, we, we just really love, you know, and you guys should know this by now, like optionality and diversification, is, it's a big deal, but it, it enables you to pivot, right? I mean, because things yeah. can get crazy, but the, being able to be pivot and be agile, we think is a major priority. So, well, and it sounds like there's a lot more power out there for you guys to gain access to through this partnership. Yeah. I mean, if they were able to switch, was it, is it a hundred megawatts? Am I remembering that? Right? Yeah, it's a hundred megawatts, but even Jamie said on our last um, earnings call that the, the, there's actually a tremendous amount of additional power available at this site and also at additional validus sites. So, so we feel pretty comfortable with our line on power, um, which is obviously everything when it comes to, to mining. Right. Um, so, yeah. And it's behind the fence you mentioned. Yes. So. Yeah. So it's not grid connected. It's behind the fence. It's less than 2.7 cents per kilowatt hour, which is great. Um, An incredibly, in, in, incredibly competitive pricing. Um, and about 30% of that power will be generated from steam. Um, and that's the way that the infrastructure is designed. So uh, we're excited about that. So, I mean, if it's behind the grid, you know, ESG obviously is a giant thing right now and mm -hmm. uh, almost you know i almost feel like you guys not just hut eight but the miners in 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 general are getting hit a little bit over the head with this um mm -hmm. as far as energy consumption goes but having said that it is being highly scrutinized so yeah does that help with your overall esg i mean you mentioned 30 percent of that is steam it's all behind the grid so yeah Oh, absolutely. Look, ESG absolutely is a priority in our business. So we are already about 30% solar and wind powered through our grid connections in Alberta, because those are the solar and wind does make up um, a portion of that grid energy. Uh, and then yes, we will be partially steam powered as well at this new site. Um, and, and like I said, these data centers, another appetite or sorry, palatable part of this purchase is that they are all powered by um, emission-free resources or renewable resources. So, um, and plus, you know, we announced earlier, or sorry, later in 2021, that we plan on going carbon neutral by 2025. Um, we're also focused on bottom-up approaches to our business. So how do, you know, we've electrified all of our vehicles. We've, we've taken measures to reduce our landfill footprint. So, so the environment as a sh shareholder and stakeholder in our business is certainly a priority. Do you guys think you're going to have to, so you mentioned going carbon neutral by 2025. Are you going to be able to do that organically through just converting all of your power to carbon neutral? Or do you think you're going to have to buy, you know, carbon credits and that kind of stuff? Or is that just yeah. remains to be seen? So, so it remains to be seen for now. It is looking like carbon credits. Um, but, you know, we're also very conscious of, of, are you actually buying credits for, projects that offset your emissions. And that is a very difficult one-to-one -one relationship to prove for anyone in the market who's, right. who's doing carbon credit offsets. Um, so, so we do have some other ideas that we're looking at, you know, certainly let you guys know when we, when I can, but um, 
but it, it's it's a major priority for us for sure. And, and joining things like we joined the Business Renewable Center, which is a not-for-profit group that's focused on um, you know, bringing more awareness towards renewables operators and innovation in the renewable space in Canada. So we're part of that group. We're the first miner to ever join that group. We're part of the Bitcoin Mining Council. So, so we think we're doing all the right things um, to sort of generate awareness. Also, sorry, I'm going on a bit of a tangent here, if you don't mind, right. but but it's also wild um, the amount of of mis mis um, you know fear uncertainty and doubt and and misinformation that's happening in the media um, like for example even in Q4 uh, the mining industry actually increased in efficiency by nine percent and increased in sustainability by one percent if any other industry in the world were to have those those types of improvements they would win a Nobel Prize right but I think I think. <laughs> Mining is such an easy target because it's so open source. It's easy to to sort of see how much energy is being used, which, by the way, is sixty six percent renewable. Um, you know, versus versus again, it's 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 it's. But I think because it's so open and transparent, it does somewhat make it an easy target. Um, but again, we're we're working with the right groups. We feel to make sure that you know we're we're educating regulators and politicians um, about how this industry actually works. So that's a good question. Along with the ESG, you know, you're getting you get a lot of pressure from investors and the public on this energy stuff. But how about on the political side? You guys are, I think, all three of your sites. You're 100 percent in Canada right now. Mm. And so, you know, in the United States, we're going through all kinds of, you know, the legislature is talking about doing this and doing that. And, and that's creating a lot of fear and uncertainty because, you know, we don't have answers yet. So yeah. and, and yet, but obviously it's a big topic of conversation. So how I don't think that, you know, whatever we do here, it seems like won't affect you guys. But but what? What does Canada look like? What's the political landscape there versus what's happening here? Yeah, so I think, you know, if the U.S., one thing we're certainly cognizant of um, is that if the U.S. were to take a hard line, occasionally, and there have been instances in the past where, where oftentimes Canada will, will uh, enact similar legislations and laws. And so we don't want any copycat behavior because, you know, that could potentially happen if the U.S. were to take a hard line. Um, but I have to say, so internally in-house, we are in-house counsel, Tanya Woods, was actually instrumental in drafting some of the preliminary blockchain laws in Canada. Um, she's nonpartisan. She's friends with both sides of the aisle. Um, and she's been very instrumental uh, in her history uh, in her career of drafting regulation and rules um, in the spirit of innovation. So again, we feel like education and building the right relationships is the best that we can do and the most effective thing we can do. And also, you know, regulation isn't a bad thing. If, if we can all be provided a framework to play safely and, and the right parameters to, to innovate, it's, it's only going to create more investment and more jobs in the region. So right now we're just focused on an education big time. Well, I think you guys are definitely leading in that and doing a good job. And I think what you just said is crucially important. One of the things the uncertainty of not having regulation, in my opinion, is worse than whatever regulation may be coming. Absolutely. Tell, tell everybody the rules and, you know, then everybody can follow the rules. And, and they're not I I don't want to jinx you guys or put words in your mouth, but I will tell you that I do not believe any severe regulations are coming. I think, yeah. you know, some sufficient regulations are, you know, and, and we sense. welcome yeah, and we welcome that. And I, I do personally. This is not Hudate's opinion. This is Sue's personal opinion. I also don't think that there are severe regulations coming. I mean, that could be, I could be wrong, but this is my personal opinion. If you look at the amount of investment that's happening in the space, from even you know you've got Goldman Sachs and the J.P. Morgans and the N.Y. Digs and Visa and Mastercard are now providing crypto rails. So. So, you know, Ted Cruz is, is a major advocate for the system out of Texas. So for the U.S. to effectively shut all those major enterprises and banks who are, that are now, you know, spending capital on building in this space, I think would be a real extraordinary move. Um, and I, I don't think would be in the best interest of the U.S. And I think, I think a lot of the regulators understand that. So... Also, Genzer was an MIT professor in distributed open source technology. He understands the space, right? So 
Right. That uh, think, initially was very encouraging. I, I think everybody yeah. thought there was going to be a lot of acceptance of and, you know, like you said, I mean, Bitcoin is gaining massive acceptance institutionally in yeah, the United absolutely. States and everywhere, I think so. Yeah, you even look at, um, I forget which governing body it was, but I believe there was there was one of the regulatory bodies was working on providing framework so that banks could accept Bitcoin as collateral. That is extraordinary. So to think that Biden or whoever is going to come in and shut that all down, I, I Sue, not Huddy, Sue does not think that's going to happen. But again, that remains to be seen. Um, that's just my personal opinion. Um, so we'll see, though. Well, I'm with you, Sue, but I guess you're right. We'll have to wait and see. So yeah. um, to, to go back to your your high performance computing stuff, what? how much business do you guys plan on generating? Are you, uh, you know, with whatever parameters you're allowed to talk within, is this going to be, yeah. you know, 1% of your business, 10% of your business? Well, that's a really good question. Uh, I don't, I don't have enough line of sight to, to give you stats around that right now. But like I said, you can do the math. It's 400 commercial customers. Margins in the traditional data center space are about 20 to 40%. Um, we got it at about six times EBITDA um, for 30 million cash. So um, yeah. Well, that kind of answers the question right there. <laughs> and obviously I assume you guys plan on growing it, so. Absolutely, absolutely. And you have a third line of revenue that I, I never hear anybody talk about, but on your financial statements, it looks like you guys do a bunch of hosting also. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we've been doing hosting for a while. Um, again, that was part of our sort of original diversification strategy. We've got about 12.5 megawatts. Actually, you know what? Apologies, that's gone down. We've got about 11 megawatts or so that we're putting towards hosting. Um, that earned us last quarter or the quarter before a little over 2 million bucks a quarter. Um, and then we also have 2000 Bitcoin that are currently earning yield, a little under 2.5% yield with um, Genesis and Galaxy. So, so uh, revenue stream. yeah, so because again, at the end of the day, if you if you truly want to be a hodler and a builder in this space, mine, 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 spend, spend, spend and hold isn't a sound business plan because what do you do when bitcoin can't catch a bid or when bitcoin's trade sideways you either raise money in a bear market or you sell so diversification is key plus we're able to now capture growth on both sides of the digitalization of the economy ledger yeah the hosting amount was not a small amount i mean it may be an easy thing for you guys to do but like you said it's a couple million dollars a quarter and that's yeah. got to pay a lot of the you know overhead bills yeah, exactly. So is that something you guys are going to expand as you go along or is that just, a, you know, it is what it is? Uh, no, I mean, it's something, look, we've got, I mean, it's, it's certainly something we're looking at. I mean, given up until I'd say probably a month ago, uh, especially after the Chinese exodus, we had an insane amount of calls coming our way asking, you know, can we host, can we host? Oh, and we ran the math and, and the margins on hosting are, are relatively robust, but it was much more profitable to actually just mine yourself uh, and obviously <laughs> win Bitcoin. So, um, but look, that's certainly a case that we'll be reevaluating on a month by month basis, given on what's happening in the industry. So. Okay. So you're saying, you know, you don't want to hold forever. You guys are kind of the champions of holding. I think you've you have more self-mined Bitcoin than, than anybody. Is that yes, we do. Right and, and it's not that we don't want to hodl forever. It's that we don't believe that this just stops at hodling. Cause, cause at the, okay. So, so let's say, look out after the next happening, you've got a ton of Bitcoin. Okay. Then what, then what, what are you going to build? What's the point? Right? What? So, so this is our point. This is our raison d'etre is that we're going to be the fed and we're minting the reserve of currency of the future. But also we want to be the infrastructure and the the visa and the mastercard and the the aws so yeah and you guys and are much more vertically integrated i think than most of the mining the bitcoin mining space you 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 yeah. do all your own hosting you guys do i think you're a licensed uh repairer yes yeah so i don't yeah. know how much revenue that generates but it's certainly nice to be able to fix all of your own machines 
It is. And also it actually got us closer to the supply chain, um, which was super important to us. Um, so we've got a great relationship with MicroBT. And yes, we are the sole um, authorized MicroBT repair shop in Canada and also for Northern Europe. So, wow. um, I mean, in terms of revenue streams, I wouldn't say it's, you know, being gangbusters, but, but again, getting closer to that supply chain and making sure you have a wonderful relationship with one of the top manufacturers was, was of strategic importance for us. So. Yeah, that's crucial. And I know you guys have always done a good job of getting your machines at a reasonable cost. There have been some people that have paid top dollar for a significant amount of machines over yeah. the last six or eight months. So, and I don't think you guys did any of that. No, no. Well, very nice. Uh, what I was going to ask you is, is there a price without saying the number? I mean, have you guys talked about, you know, we've got I think over 5,000 Bitcoin. Is there it's a number? Over, over 5,500, over 5,500. Over yeah. 5,500 Bitcoin. So that's a massive supply, none of which you bought, all of which you mined, I believe, right? Correct. So yes, yeah. So is there a number out there? You know, you've talked a lot about how this is cyclical. You know, if Bitcoin gets to a certain spot, are you guys considering, you know, selling some of that? I mean, look, we're Bitcoin bulls. Um, so for example, I believe it was when JP Morgan came out with 144,000 price target for Bitcoin. We agreed with that. If you look at if Bitcoin were to capture even two to 3% of the negative yielding credit market, um, cause I actually think that's a better place than someone's portfolio instead of negative yielding debt, put a little money into Bitcoin instead. So if, if Bitcoin were to capture even two to 3% of, of the trillions of dollars worth of, in the credit market, a negative yielding credit market, that is like a, a two to $3 million price tag per coin. I'm not saying it's gonna to get to that point, but but if, if you look at it in terms of what other market share it could capture, even in two to 3% via gold, be it negative yielding debt. Um, so my, my long-winded point there is that um, we really believe in the upside potential for this asset class. Um, and so, yeah, we're going to hang on for as long as possible. But I mean, look, if, if Bitcoin were to crest a hundred thousand bucks, maybe we would reevaluate the, the HODL versus sell case. But again, we, we'd want to make sure that we were selling for a reason and, and, and it, it would be to, to build back into the ecosystem. Like, like this doesn't just stop at holding Bitcoin. So. Right. Well, I know you guys, I've heard you talk about how you take a balance sheet approach to the company. And I was reviewing your balance sheet today. It's, I mean, you guys are like no other miner out there. Your, 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 your liquid assets, your current assets are massive. It is. Um, and we have almost no debt, but, and it, but again, that comes from because we've been around for so long. So we've, we've felt the pain of the bear markets before versus a lot of the entrants this year, this is their first sort of rodeo. Right. Um, so, and, you know, a lot of people came in seeing the incredibly sexy margins when Bitcoin was trading at 70 K, but we know what happens when, when those margins turn sideways and you paid too much for your equipment. So, um, yeah, we've, well, we've learned our lesson. And a lot of your liquidity is cash. I noticed. Yeah. So it's not just, you know, you don't, you're in no position where I know you don't have to sell your Bitcoin. I was just wondering, you know, if it ran up to 150,000, you know, it's, it's hard not to at least take a look at that. Oh, for sure. And like I said, so, so, so we would certainly reevaluate and probably have an internal discussion as to whether or not it was time to, to pull the trigger. But, but again, the whole question is, well, then what are you doing though? Right. So, so what are you just going to keep sitting on cash? Like we we're building for the long game. So, so do you guys have, I, I've read, um, you know, in exahash, I think you guys just passed two exahash yeah. recently. Um, and you've got a bunch more than that purchase ordered. Yes. Is the goal yeah. to just keep going, you know? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, we're, we're always going to be Bitcoin miners, or at least that's for, for, for now. That's, that's the plan that that is our, our core bread and butter. Um, but, but again, we, we want to be the bridge between traditional and nascent high performance compute. We want to be the Amazon web services for, for web three and the metaverse and some of these incredibly compelling, the gaming blockchain gaming universe, which is a $268 billion opportunity. We want to be playing and supporting that. Um, 
But yeah, no, are we going to go and announce crazy exahash goals for the end of this year, given how crazy and volatile these markets are? No, absolutely not. Like we're not, every single one of our competitors, even us, did not meet our exahash goals in 2021. Um, and we don't want to be in a constant position of over-promising and under-delivering. So we're not going to play into those headlines. Um, but yeah, absolutely continuing to build a thoughtful digital asset mining, but also data center business is the goal. Okay. That makes sense. I know, you know, a lot of these, there's a lot, like you said, of new companies that have just kind of been popping up out of the woodwork and yeah. they're not necessarily mining anything right now, Exactly. Um, but they have press releases about, you know, 15 X a hash and 20 X a hash, but you know, I'm running the numbers like they're going to need a billion dollars. Exactly. <laughs> they're going to need a billion dollars. And they were all, they've all been banking on Bitcoin staying bid this year. And it, and it might not. I mean, the long game, we think it's going to catch a bid, but for this year. And so it's how, how do you, how do you pay off your equipment if you can't maintain your margins? So, right. And, and or even get delivery on equipment. So fun fact, we actually, so we spent, we spent 30 million bucks on this data center business on 400 commercial customers diversification, which we're so excited about. Um, but we obviously looked at, okay, so what will 30 million bucks get us if we were to just buy some mining equipment and buy some petahash? So 30 million bucks would have gotten us 450 petahash. Um, for delivery though, in the next 12 months. So not even now. And we think that exahash is only going to continue to grow incrementally. So it's either 450 petahash, which is an extra maybe 60 Bitcoin right. or 400 enterprise customers who are paying you cash. So that was almost a no brainer for us. Yeah, and I think you guys have, I'm looking forward to talking to you six months from now and a year from now, because I think you you guys know where you're going with that side of it. And it sounds like there's some very exciting stuff coming. So Great. anything else, can you? Can I ask you just one more open-ended question? If you could tell the world something about Hut 8, and I know you kind of told the world who you are and what you guys do to start with, yeah. but what did I miss? What What's, what's going on? Look, I think... Um, we covered a lot of exciting things today, but, and I think we covered a lot of sort of the core things I wanted to talk about with you and your audience today, but honestly, truly like just stay tuned. What Jamie Leverton is building is, is incredibly unique. I like to say she's Elon Musk 2.0, but just, just stay tuned. This woman is a force and um, we've got really exciting plans here and she looks at things a lot different than anyone else in this space. And that's because of her background. So just, just stay tuned because we're pumped. Awesome. Well, Sue, I want to thank you so much. I appreciate you giving us an update and, uh, hopefully we will see you again sometime. Thanks so much. Bye. Good to talk to you. Bye. Good to talk to you.